Um, so, <laughs> let me start by saying that uh, when I was Attorney General, I would frequently go to meetings where I felt like uh, one of the Sesame Street characters, the one of those things is not like the other, um, which some of you may remember from being uh, a kid, because I was always a lot younger by about 20 years and a lot more female um, than <laughs> most of the Attorneys General. There were about five women when I was there. And I woke up this morning, I felt a little bit the same way, which is just a long way of explaining to you why my PowerPoint is going to be a lot less sexy than Mike's, um, and there's no lava lamps or anything else. So uh, basically, what I want to talk about is money balling criminal justice, and I want to just give you a couple of reasons why I think that we have to start applying these great tools that we use in the rest of the world to things like criminal justice. My background is as a criminal prosecutor. I started as a state DA, a local DA in Manhattan. Um, I was at the United States Department of Justice, and then I ultimately became the Attorney General. Why it's important that I was the Attorney General is that that is a 9,500 person office that runs the criminal justice system for the state of New Jersey. So unlike a lot of other states, we ran the state police, we oversaw all the county prosecutors, all the police officers, I was the chief law enforcement officer in the entire state, we ran the Juvenile Justice Commission, and what that gave me was a really unique opportunity to look at this system as a whole and to see and to learn things that I had no idea when I was just prosecuting cases um, were actually happening. The one example I really want to give you about data and technology, and there are other examples up here um, that we can come back to later, but I want to talk about the Camden Police Department. A prior attorney general had superseded the Camden Police Department. Again, the attorney general is the chief law enforcement officer. It means you could take over any county any state, any local police department prosecutor's office. A former AG had taken over the police department. And Camden, as you know, for many years was the most dangerous city in America. And when I started, it was the most dangerous city in America. And my personal view was not on my watch, right? That the people of Camden deserve better. And so I spent an unbelievable amount of time in Camden, and it was one of the hardest things that I worked on. And part of the issue that I came to day one, my first day in the police department, was the lack of data and technology. Now, what we started talking about in Camden was CompStat, right? Everybody's heard of CompStat. It's the police analytical tool. It allows you to figure out where crimes are happening and where police officers are deployed. I went to the CompStat meeting in Camden, and you don't need technology to do it, right? You just need data. But instead of having any system, what they had were yellow stickies. And so the captain in charge of homicides had a yellow sticky where he would hold it up and say, well, last week we had three homicides. Here are the addresses. We have no suspects. And then the person next to him who was in charge of robbery would say, last week we had, you know, 40 robberies, here are the locations, we have no suspects. That's not data, and or at least it's not data that can be used to proactively fight crime. We, re we changed that by using technology to convince the police department to c not only collect the data, but then to be able to use it. And what the technology gave to us, and it has made me a huge believer in data and technology changing the way government works, was the ability to actually show people and to take a lot of information that people individually couldn't bring together and put it in a place and in a way that people could use. So then I started looking at the fact that in baseball, healthcare, education, Everybody uses data. In criminal justice, we don't. At any given time, we we're making the most important decisions in criminal justice. Who should be in jail? Who should be released? What works best for whom, right? If we want to reduce crime, which we do, and we want to make government fairer and more efficient, um, we need to be answering these questions. This is a huge impact not only on public safety, but if we're talking about what we should be looking at in local and state governments, prisons are always the second biggest item in state budgets. So we're talking about huge amounts of money that are being spent um, without being data-driven. And so it's startling to me that there are all these questions that we can't answer. When I've talked, and I've spent a lot of time over the past year talking with police uh, chiefs, prosecutors, public defenders, courts, jails, prisons, probation, parole, and I've asked them, who's in your system? Who, what, what offenses are driving your system? How long are people staying? How long does it take people to make bail? What's the average amount of time that people are staying? They can't answer those questions. And it's important to recognize, and to all the fellows, it's important to recognize that overwhelmingly, some of the questions will be able to be answered, and the ones that they can't answer, it's not that they don't want to, and it's not that they're not great people trying to do the right thing. 
basically, a lot of these systems don't have data, or they have data in handwritten form that has never been consolidated or put together, or if they have data, even imagine a jurisdiction, which I've yet to find, where the police, the prosecutors, the defenders, the court, and all those other actors have great data. I promise you it's not shared, and it's not shared in the way that it would need to be shared in order to have the information we need to make the right decisions about how we reduce crime, how we make the system more efficient. And also, obviously, there are cultural hurdles, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's an important consideration. So it's a huge puddle, puzzle, criminal justice. And any kid can tell you that if you have half the pieces of the puzzle, you can't figure out what the full picture is. This is what criminal justice in America looks like today. It's a puzzle with a lot of pieces that aren't being collected and aren't being organized, and the information is there. So what we're doing this year, um, we have a great partnership that we're so excited about with Code for America, um, with both Louisville and New York City. We've also got Blue Ridge Foundation who's with us. Um, and the idea is to moneyball criminal justice, to pull together data from all these different sources, from all these different people, to x-ray the system, and to be able to figure out who's doing what, what's happening, and what types of apps or other applications can be created to make the system work better, be fairer, reduce crime, and be more efficient. We'll also, as part of the partnership, we'll also provide additional resources and assistance. Um, at the same time, we're studying all these key questions, right? Can we figure out nationally what the best type of risk tool is to figure out whether someone should be released or detained? Can we create uh, risk assessments and tools, matrices for district attorneys, for police departments, for courts. We're in the process of doing that now. Um, and what we're finding is that even getting data to do that is difficult. So for our national tool, we have eight jurisdictions, some are states, some are counties, who have been able to supply us with the data we need. And think about that for a minute. There are 3,000 jails in the United States of America. You all come from 50 states. I have eight jurisdictions right now that can provide me the information that I need to figure this out. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. We're really excited about it. Um, and working with technology, I think, you know, I'm going to leave you guys with a couple of uh, closing thoughts. Um, first is that people tell you that criminal justice is unlike other parts of the system. You can't moneyball it. You can't use data. It's not true. It's not true about any part of local government. It can all benefit from the use of data and technology. Um, the second thing is, I saw this quote from Nate Silver on Friday. Um, and what Nate does, obviously, he started with, with baseball, and then he went on to doing political elections. And he was asked, what's the next predictive field that we can impact using data and technology? And his answer is local government. Right? And I believe that in criminal justice, that is exactly the way that we will change the process and the system to make it more fair and to reduce crime. Thank you very much.